Okay, and I'm back. Interesting. Not sure what happened there. Was the audio with us the whole time, or did you only, or or did you lose video and audio the whole time? I I'm not sure exactly when I dropped out there. Anybody have feedback for me on that? Okay. Not sure what caused that drop. All right. Well, I'm going to keep an eye on it now. I have my window over here on the side. So thank you for letting me know. Um, looks like we're back. All right. Moving forward. So there was a CVE this week for CVE 2021-25736. For a cube proxy load balancer contention. This is actually for um, window, if you're running Kubernetes on Windows, this is this, this may affect you. It's a medium version and I think it looks out like load balancer does not set load balancer ingress IP field clusters where load balancer controller sets the, are unaffected. Unexpected processes listening on the same port by the load balancer service could indicate exploitation of this issue and should be investigated. So in this way, I think you're able to like take over or maybe impersonate the correct endpoint. And then you would actually um, be uh, able to attract traffic to your to your your hijacked load balancer. So that should be interesting. Seems like it only affects Windows. The next one up is a security issue was discovered in Kubernetes where a user may be able to redirect pod traffic to private networks on a node. Kubernetes already prevents creation of endpoint IPs in localhost or link local range, but some, but the same validation was not performed on endpoint slices. And so this is actually, I think, a defect in endpoint slices specifically. Fixed versions are already out. To mitigate this vulnerability without upgrading the Kubernetes API server, you can create a validating admission webhook that prevents endpoint slices with endpoint addresses in the 127 or 169254 ranges. Um, and presumably that's the filter that has been patched. So that's an interesting one because it means that you basically be able to un override the endpoint slice object and redirect traffic to localhost or to some other um, local addressing. Uh, anytime, anytime they put this stuff up, I think this is an important point, right? If you find evidence of this vulnerability that has, has been exploited, please contact us. So that's an interesting one. The next one in our list is a security issue was discovered in the Kubernetes Java client library. So if you're using the Java client, it would, it could give you the ability to kind of manipulate the inputs. This was reported by Jordi Versmussen through our bug bounty, bug bounty program. Very cool. So it looks like they've already got a fixed, uh, we've already got fixed version out. Um, and it looks like if so, if you're using the Java client, there may be a CVE that, or there is a CVE that could actually, uh, that isn't sanitizing inputs correctly. And that's my, that's from, was posted by Tim. That's an interesting one. The last one, you're probably going to hear me talk about this one a little bit more. I think this one's interesting. Um, what this one is about, oh wow, that's still empty. Let's see if I can find, so this is a run C vulnerability that enables a A time to time to time to check to time to first use attack, and so it's a timing attack, and it lets you effectively use Run C to uh, do a symlink traversal into um, and and change what has been mounted from when it was originally first checked. So I'm going to do a whole episode, I think, on this particular CVE, but it won't be until probably maybe the next episode or possibly the episode after that. But this one is a really important one. And what I will say is that it is actually pretty darn important 
that you go ahead and patch run C if you're using it to a version forward of RC95. Um, I think it's really important that people patch this stuff. And I think that, um, and there'll be a blog post, a Kubernetes blog post coming out and lots of other information about this coming up soon. But suffice to say, because of this run C CVE, if you're using Containerd as your container runtime, or if you're using Docker as your container runtime, it may definitely behoove you to go ahead and patch uh, whatever it is that's providing Run C and get that uh, fixed up pretty quick. So definitely an important one. CNCF things, what's coming in the CNCF? We've got a few different sessions coming up this week. Um, I should I should actually change this. It'll, this will just be a summary and it won't be weekly. It'll be every two weeks. And maybe I'll actually um, include programs that have passed and also the ones that are coming up. And so some of the CNCF online programs that are coming up are Matt Stratton from Pulumi talking about using your favorite programming language to build your dream cloud native uh, platform. We have tackling customer issues in cloud native environments by Eleanor Sperry from Workout. Uh, cloud native policy enforcement with open policy agent from Anders Eckert and the Styra. <coughs> and persist your data in ephemeral uh, Kubernetes ecosystem with Eric Zeitlow and Maya Data. If you're interested in any of these online programs, definitely just click through and go be a part of them. Um, lots of interesting stuff there. If I click on one of them, you can see basically what this does. It takes me to the CNCF community groups page. And this one is already recorded, it looks like. And so you'd be able to watch that live on YouTube. And if you have questions, the person to reach out to for those sorts of things is definitely the person that I've linked here. So in this case, you could reach out to Matt Stratton or any of the other folks in those in those lists. So that is what's happening in Cloud Native this week. That was a lot of data. I hope that some of it showed up. I know that I know that I was like frozen for a little while, and I'm not sure what happened there. That was kind of weird. But looks like we're back in play here. So this Wednesday, I'll be participating at the Austin Kubernetes meetup with Crudge and my friend Jason Didaviris. So we're going to get to see two awful geeks, uh, possibly more than two awful geeks talking about different things. And at that meetup, I'll be presenting like how to use KubeADM to do, uh, to, to, as a playground for studying for the CK X, uh, certificates. So definitely check that out. That'll be a fun one. I'll be doing more talks coming up as well. And then the next thing that we're going to dig into today is a, an open source project of some kind. And so today I'm actually going to dig into Minikube because, and I'll tell you why, uh, this is actually kind of an interesting thing. So I've been working at Isovalent and that means I'm working on a CNI that's called Cilium. If you haven't checked out Cilium, definitely do so. It's a very cool CNI. Um, Cilium is, because Cilium operates at like the eBPF layer, it means that it's probably better for us to make sure that we have a Linux kernel for each of your Kubernetes nodes. And that means that for my particular environments, I've been trying to figure out, you know, kind of a reasonable way to create a multi-node cluster where each node has its own kernel. Um, typically what I've been doing, normally what I've been doing is actually leveraging, um, Kind, which is a really great open source project. And if you haven't heard of Kind, definitely check that out. I'll bring it up here. So kind.sigs.k8.io. This is the Kind project. And Kind is really, really great. But it, but the, one of the challenges that I ran into is that Kind uh, shares the same Linux kernel for each node. It means that However many nodes you make in a Kind cluster, they're all going to get the same Linux kernel um, because Kind nodes run as Docker containers, which is actually kind of interesting and super awesome and super handy. And there's a, still a lot about the Kind project that I'm going to use every day, um, especially if I'm trying to like patch or modify or play with the Kubernetes code base, or if I'm trying to actually do... Um, you know, Kubernetes and CI, like having Kubernetes run in Docker containers means that doing CI tests, like that schema validation that we talked about earlier, super way, way easier in kind that it would be in perhaps like a virtualized environment. But for my own purposes right now, what I have been doing lately is using this project. 
And I have to tell you, it's been a while. It's been a while since I actually took a look at Minikube, and this is actually why I kind of highlighted it in this session, because I think it's definitely worth highlighting Minikube as an open source project, or, you know, as part of the, the this stuff, has actually come really quite far since the last time I looked at it. Uh, the last time I looked at it, it didn't actually, I think it was actually already using KubeADM as a bootstrapper, but there were a lot of other things that it did not do. For example, it couldn't give you multiple nodes. And I don't think at the time we even had the idea of profiles, right? So you couldn't create multiple clusters. So there was lots of stuff, for example, that it didn't do. So I'm going to show you my, uh, my flow. We're going to work through my flow for spinning up a Kubernetes cluster with Cilium. And we're going to play with that a little bit to kind of show that off and show like what you can actually do with Minikube now, because I've been incredibly impressed. <clears throat> All right, so I've got Minikube running. And I'm running version 1.21.0, which might be the most recent. Oh, it looks like maybe I just recently built it or something. But config view. So I'm using, so these are things that you can actually specify with Minikube, which are actually pretty neat. So if I were to do Minikube start, for example, and then help, these are all the different lines of configuration that you can specify. And for each of these things, you can actually set a, uh, a, a particular configuration for it to, to be operated on by default, right? And so in my, when I do Minikube config view, if you do Minikube config view, you, you'll be able to see like what has been specified by default for all Minikube clusters that you might create. So in my particular case, uh, I'm actually gonna go ahead and we'll change that memory setting because that's too low. It has to be at least 1900, I think it is. So we'll do Minikube config set memory 1900. If we do Minikube config view, we can see that it's 1900 now, and that stands, that'll be megabytes. I'm actually also using the KVM driver, uh, and this is because I'm actually using KVM as my virtualization on my Linux laptop here. And then Bootstrapper, there's actually a few different Bootstrappers, and I think it might be worth checking out if you are unaware of this. This actually kind of impressed me. So on the Bootstrapper side, Minikube. Config get boot. Well, let's see. Minikube help grab. Minikube start help. Bootstrapper, bootstrapper. Nope. Config. No, you know what? I'm probably doing this the wrong way, so let's do it this way. Probably just go back to the docs. Bootstrapper. Config. There we go. All right. So the default is KubeADM, but there are other bootstrappers And I wanted to show you that because I think I saw Well, it will use KubeADM by default, but I 
am under the impression that you have other options for a bootstrapper. And I wanted to show you what those were, but I don't think I'm going to be able to get to that because I don't see a way to show you that in the output. And that's okay. So let's, so for the, for my purposes, it's going to be Cubidium. It's actually going to be kind of neat. So let's do Minikube config view again. So we're using the KVM driver. You can use VirtualBox, you can use Docker. There's a bunch of different drivers that you can use for this stuff. We're gonna use the KubeADM bootstrapper. And then for the container D run for the container runtime, we can actually specify whether to use Docker, Container D, Podman. There's a, a variety of different container runtimes you can use. In the image. So let's go ahead and check this out. So let's do minikube start. And then this was something I learned. So if you do dash P, you can specify a profile and that gives you the ability to name the cluster, whatever you want, right? So we'll call this one C1. And then the other thing that blew my mind lately is that you can actually also specify how many nodes. So I'm going to create two nodes here. I'm going to give uh, two CPUs to each one of them. And I'm going to give them their own name. I'm going to give this guy its own named network that I'm going to share with another cluster. So we'll call it uh, Mesh. Actually, make you delete. I want to do one more thing there. Dash dash CNI equals false. So I want to bring up a cluster with no CNI. Looks like we're missing an image here, so we're gonna let we're gonna let that download. Shouldn't be too long. Fast internet at home. I love it. Thank you for for letting me know for 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 letting me know that you're you're happy to see me streaming again. I'm I'm happy to be streaming again. I know that it's gonna be a a really fun thing to kind of explore with y'all. So creating our two node cluster. Oh, this is an output from the setup. Because I'm using container D, it was trying to stop the Docker service inside of that VM, but apparently that it, doesn't, it doesn't come with it turned on. So it was just giving me some erroneous error there. Probably not too big a deal. Now it's going through the QBDM steps for creating certificates and keys, booting up the control plane, configuring RBAC, doing some add-ons. Now we're creating the second VM in our cluster. Let's see what we see here. kettle get nodes you can see we have two nodes and we have a status of not ready and that's because I said don't use any CNI now there's an interesting bug in in uh, in um, minikube right now where because of the way that podman is installed if you even if you say CNI not uh, false it will install that Podman CNI configuration to disk and it'll be sitting in Etsy. So it's just SSH in here and I can show you what I'm talking about. Dash PC1. So now I'm on 
one of the um, one of the nodes in the cluster. I believe it's the the root one. So if I do Etsy CNI, you can see that there's this file called eighty seven Podman conf list, and right now it's empty. And I'll tell you how I emptied it here in a second. But the fact that this file exists in here at all means that this will be what is used for the CNI configuration. And I wanted there to be no CNI configuration. So I had to empty that file out because it was actually being put in there by default by the install of the Podman uh, bits for Minikube. So when Minikube like bundles Podman as part of a possible as a possible containerizer, it also included this like default configuration for the Podman bridge. And I did not want that. I wanted it to be empty. I wanted there not to be anything in there. So how did I fix it? You say this is actually pretty neat. So pot, so Minikube has this idea of syncing files into the virtual machine. And the way that it does that is if you go into your dot Minikube uh, directory and you go into files, Etsy, underneath that files path, you can specify things that are going to be you or that are going to be synced into the cluster. And so all I really cared about was emptying that podman bridge conf list file out. So this is the only file I'm syncing in. And if we look at SE CNI at the 87 podman, it's empty. And so what I'm doing is I'm overriding that file with an empty file to make it so that no CNI is installed or inferred in my Minikube cluster before I install one. I wanted to do that install myself, not to let anything else do it. So that's what we've got here, right? We've got a Cilium, we have a uh, cluster ready for a CNI. Nothing is running uh, CNI wise at the moment. If we do kubectl get pods dash a, we can see, for example, that core DNS is pending and it will remain pending um, until it is until there is a CNI. And that's because the core DNS is part of the it's part of the um, it's part of your pod network. It's not part of your host network, right? All the rest of these are actually running as um, as a as, as part of the host network. They're basically running as hostnet true, right? It means that if I look at the IP addresses, for example, dash O wide, I can see that many of them have conflicting IP addresses, right? There's a 109, 109, 109. This person, cube proxy is running over here on 136. And if I do cube kettle get nodes dash O wide, we can see those IP addresses, right? are the host IP addresses. So these are the IP addresses of the virtual machines that are running, not of the pods that are running. The pods are just using the network stack of the underlying host. But that's not true for core DNS. Core DNS is using a pod IP, but since there's no CNI, it can't come up because there's no pod, there's no CNI currently. So let's go ahead and install one. I'm gonna use a Cilium CLI for this. You could use Calico, Flannel, whatever you want. And actually there's a bunch of built-in CNIs in Minikube. So if you don't want to explore like some other CNI, this is just important to me for, for my work. But if you wanted to use like uh, Flannel or Calico or any, or even Cilium, uh, you can actually just specify dash dash CNI and then the name of the CNI you want it to come up with. And Minikube will configure all of that for you. Pretty cool. But for my purposes, I wanted to kind of like bring this up so that I could kind of explore my own dev environment without a CNI installed. And this is why I'm showing you this pretty neat stuff. So we can see the silly bits are starting to come up. We have one of our Cilium pods, another Cilium pod, and then the Cilium operator, all being deployed. And if we do Cilium status, we can see that it's up and running. And then if I do kubectl get pods dash a again, I'll be able to see that now that I have a, um, a CNI installed, core DNS is running. And if I do kubectl get nodes, I have my nodes specifying that they are in a ready state. So that 
is pretty neat, you know? And then the other thing I was talking about was that dash dash network flag, right? So if I did control R, uh, mini Q. This, this, this dash dash network flag If I do IP link, or actually, let's see, it would be ERCTL show. So it'll create a bridge, and it'll give that bridge a name, although it's not giving it a name in this case. The RBI, it's not super easy for you to see that. So let's do, um, why is, I wonder how I can get that name for you, IP link. The name doesn't carry down into the bridge. Okay, let's see. Actually, what if I do? Inverse list all. Oh. There we go. So this is the bridge. Net show that info mesh. There we go. So this is using KVM again. So I'm using the verse command line to kind of interact with the KVM configuration of things. And I've done a list. I've tried to got, I've told it, give me the network information for the network that is named mesh. And in this output, I can see that the bridge associated with that mesh network is VR, uh, VIR BR1. And then I should be able to do things like BRCTL show VIR BR1. And we can see we have a couple of different interfaces associated with it. And that is the bridge, right? Because we have two VMs and each of the VMs is going to have an interface associated with that bridge and that bridge takes care of like how we're actually getting traffic in and out of those VMs. Pretty cool. Um, well, yeah. So that's some of the stuff I've learned about Minikube this week and I think it's actually pretty neat. So there's a couple other things. C1 and then you can actually give it a name of the node that you want to jump into. And so if you wanted to SSH into different nodes, if you just like don't specify one, it'll still work. You'll be able to jump in and you'll be on the, the, um, the control plane node. And if you wanted to jump into the worker node, you can actually specify the name of that worker node. And if I go back up here to node list, that's C1 MO2. Just name. And there we go. So this gives me an ability to kind of jump into either of my two nodes. Each of my nodes has its own kernel because it's actually running as a virtual machine. So I don't have to worry about that part of it. Um, it gives you quite a lot of configurability. Now, resource-wise, it's not going to be nearly as efficient as something like Kind, where, where these are just where all of the Kubernetes, all of the processes running inside of a Kubernetes cluster are running inside of a container, right? We have one Linux kernel, all of those processes are basically just namespaced. But at the same time, if what you're trying to troubleshoot or interact with requires things like, uh, you know, has some requirement where each of the nodes have their own representation of a Linux kernel, then this is a way of doing that, right? And some other examples of why you might want that, like I, I want that for Cilium, but other ways, other reasons you might want that is for, for things like, um, if you're doing SE Linux testing or any sort of like enforcement at that point, if you're doing app armor testing, things that actually require like a kernel layer kind of abstraction, that sort of stuff, that'll be where it really comes in that you really want like your own kernel for it. But yeah, that is what I had for you today. So I look forward to seeing you again in two weeks. Definitely come check it out and hang with me again in two weeks. Again, there's so much great content coming out this week. There's a new show every day. There's been a lot of really great content already um, on Cloud Native TV, and a lot of those recordings are up. So if you want to check them out, definitely do so. I realize that I have to fix this problem. Like I have definitely got a, 
a CSS issue because I can't see your text inside of the chat there. But yeah, thank you for joining me. And if you uh, if you have content that you would like me to talk about in two weeks at the at the next version of this particular um, show, definitely, like I said, just jump into hackmd.io slash at TWICN and you'll be able to see next week's notes or the next show's notes, 003's notes, and you'll be able to add links and that sort of stuff that you want me to talk about. And so feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, otherwise, you can just reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, just at me in, a, in an article or a stream or a thread or anything else like that that you find that catches your interest and that you think would be a, would good, would be a good addition to the show. Definitely let me know. Keep me in the loop. I'm happy to talk about that stuff. Um, and enjoy your incredible week. Thank you all so much for tuning in. And I'll see you in, and I'll see you in two weeks. And make sure you subscribe. Yeah, subscribe to Cloud Native TV so you know those things are coming. So thanks again. And I'll see you next time.